<laughs> we got the finger guns. Car and got bigger guns. This guy. Finger guns. That's right. I was uh, dying to respond to that with thumbs. I know, I know how much you love thumbs. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? My name is Ron Sparkman, and I am the chief curiosity correspondent for Space Foundation Discovery Center. And today we've got the one and only Cobby Rose, um, and he is from Fun Fact Science. We're going to talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes about all the amazing things that he does. But we do want to remind everyone that earlier this month we announced the launch of our Center for Innovation and Education. The Center for Innovation and Education creates and delivers inclusive, innovative, and sustainable workforce development and economic opportunities programs that enable all people to actively participate in the space economy. Through public and private partnerships, the center engages students, young leaders, entrepreneurs, and professionals. We encourage you to learn more about the new Center for Innovation and Education and how you can make an impact at www.spacefoundation.com backslash CIE. Uh, and so today, our guest is Kavi Rose, founder of Fun Fact Science and physics student and research assistant at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Kavi, how's it going? How you going, brother? How you doing? <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. I'm glad we finally got around to doing this. It's, uh, it's been a while. It, it has indeed, and uh, we're definitely going to talk about a lot of great things. Uh, there's a lot going on for you and uh, over there on the other side of the world, and I uh, can't wait to someday visit and see it, and, uh, see it all in person. But let's start out with uh, you know my favorite question. How did you first fall in love with space and science? Whew. Um how did I first fall in love with that? Honestly, I think it was fairly late compared to other people. I mean, I was I was sure, I was certain I was going to be a lawyer when I was growing up. Um, and then it was only when I was 18, 19, um, and I moved here actually, I was born in Australia, but I moved over here to Israel when I was 18. And I think it was over the process of, you know, when I moved here, uh, when you move to Israel and you're over the age of 18, you actually have to do a mandatory military service. And when I did the military service, I ended up getting injured. I moved out of combat and they put me in electro optics. And then when I was doing the courses to get prepared for that, suddenly I realized, oh, you know, this science stuff is pretty cool. Why did I stop doing that? Um, and so basically I had the perfect combination. I was serving in a remote location, so I had really long bus rides. Um, and that was when I discovered Star Talk and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, that definitely got me into science. Um, and then at the same time, I basically was in these remote locations where there was little to no light pollution, and most of the electro optics gear is based on technology that amplifies starlight. So basically, I had the perfect night vision astronomy setup uh, in a remote location just to do my own thing, and that's really where I fell in love with uh, space and astronomy and science. And so uh, before we get into some more in-depth uh, topics a little bit later on it, can you tell us a little bit about your field of research and uh, what it is you're currently working on? So uh, my field of research in general is uh, observational astrophysics. I mean, most uh, areas of science, especially physics, have kind of a split between theorists and experimentalists. It's kind of hard to be an experimental astrophysicist because you don't really have uh, a lab where you can control the environment. So normally... Uh, the equivalent of the experimentalist in astrophysics is uh, an observationalist. So basically, it's a taking, uh, making observations, taking data from the observations at you know, different wavelengths. Most of the work uh, that I do is uh, at radio wavelengths and optical wavelengths. And it's basically looking for transients, looking for things that are suddenly flashing in the sky. Um, we work with a lot of people around the world, a lot of uh, uh, amazing scientists and other astrophysicists. Um, and some amazing um, telescope, I, I guess you'd call them systems, it's basically these pipelines where they're monitoring patches of the sky and taking photos of the same places, you know, mapping the entire sky um, on a regular basis. And so you can discover astronomical transients like that, events that, you know, suddenly something wasn't bright until now, and yeah, it pops up. And so we do follow-ups, um, we look to see if these events are supernovas, uh, tidal disruption events. Um, there are all sorts of amazing phenomena in the sky. So that's most of what I'm focused on. And so uh, let, let's dive into the deep end of the pool here and talk about you know the platform that you've created that uh, that is really, it, it's awesome. And I love that every so often I get to collaborate with you on it. And um, it, especially because it touches on more than just the science, the, the, the space science that you and I both love. You can really kind of come in and, uh, in any direction and share some really cool things there. So let's talk about Fun Fact Science. 
what made you decide to create this uh, this fantastic platform? I think uh, it's a really good question, and and I feel like I get asked the question a lot, and I think at the end of the day, I just thought it was important. I thought it was important to share science, to not just you know be sitting in the towers of academia, learning things, discovering new things about the universe, and you know if you're not sharing them with people, what does it really do? Um, you know, people write these amazing academic papers, and if you're in the field and you can understand the way that they're written and the, the language and the kind of this esoteric terminology, it's meaningful to you. But it, it was important to me to find a way to share this stuff with people, to, to share the interesting things I was learning both in my degree and through research and just through friends of mine. I mean, as I said before, I didn't have a strong science background going up. So once I developed this love for uh, space and physics and astronomy, I suddenly started recognizing, oh wait, you know, my friends who are into biology and geology and you know, wildlife ecology, this stuff is really interesting too. I want to find a way to share, um, you know, just basic, simple, interesting facts. And, uh, and that's how it started. And I uh, just want to give a quick shout out to uh, fellow uh, astronomy friends out there. Uh, Abby, Gary, and Dusty are all saying hello. They're on, they're watching the show today. Always glad to see fellow astronomers on here. So uh, it, that always makes me happy whenever we, we get some, some people that are probably going to ask some really great questions. So that's what I want to remind you of. This is uh, a live show. So if you got any questions you want to talk about, you know, astronomy, deep space, all the fun stuff that Kavi gets to work on, then uh, please feel free to drop those. We'll throw the comments up and we'll try to answer what we can as we uh, as we go along through the interview. So Fun Fact Science, you created it and uh, you were doing a really great job with it. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, a post goes viral and it starts to get a lot of attention. And uh, I know that yeah, and this is what, yeah, because I, I know you laugh. It's so funny because we have to talk about what it was. And, and I think, and I want to make a point of it is that you never know what it's going to be that's going to get the public's attention. And uh, I love this. I love this story. And I love the fact that you laughed about it. I knew that you would. So let's talk a little bit about that, that post that went viral and kind of kind of made Fun Fact Science a thing. Well, I mean, like I was saying before, there are, there are the things that I was sharing on Fun Fact Science that were related to my area of study, my research, my passion. And then there were other things. There were things that I thought were interesting from totally different areas that I'm not necessarily an expert in. Um, and generally, you know, as opposed to the things that, that I understood, I would know, do a bit of research and, and, and really get involved in preparing a post. Um, but there were other posts where it was more like seeing other people doing amazing science and creating amazing content and wanting to help them get that content out there. Uh, so this was one of those cases. It was um, a video of an owl um, that had, uh, I guess, fallen into a river. Um, in this canyon and, and people were just mesmerized for some reason by this video of an owl kind of, you know, do, uh, swimming through this river until it got to an embankment and was able to, you know, get out and dry off its wings. And it was just like the last thing that I'd ever expected um, that would actually, you know, go viral. And I saw the page jumping up from a few thousand followers to uh, tens of thousands of followers within a month. And I think that's one of the cool things about it is that, you know, just continue to share the things that you do. Um, you know, Fraser Kane from Universe Today, uh, not to do like the name drop, but, you know, some time ago when I first started and, you know, hardly um, hardly anybody knew who I was. And uh, I asked him the question, he's like, you know, what advice do you have? This was on in, an interview very similar to this one. And I asked him what advice he had. He said, just keep showing up. You know, the more that you do, that's the whole thing about science communication. There's a lot of people that are out in the crowd, but after some time, those those people may give up, they may start to fall away, or you may end up finding your voice in a way that really connects with people. And you've got, you know, you've got some travel under your belt. You've, you know, you've been kind of all over and you've, uh, it's also a place where, you know, there's people like you, there's people at Rio, there's people that are in the area, but we don't see too many science communicators that really jump out to me, at least, um, from, uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, and, you know, from, from really Israel overall. But uh, it's something that maybe a lot of people don't know. Israel does have a space agency. So let's, let's we'll talk about that one just for a minute um, because there's something uh, we actually got to go to a launch that they were a part of. But the Israel Space Agency, let's discuss it a little bit for people that may not know it and uh, a little bit of what they're up to. Now, Kavi does not work for the Israel Space Agency. He just knows enough about them to be able to answer the question. <laughs> just want to plant that flag. <laughs> I just want to plant that flag. He's not a representative. We're just talking about the fact that Israel does have a space agency. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, going back to the first point that you were making, um, you don't really hear about science communicators from other parts of the world if they're not English-speaking countries. I mean, 
it's kind of tough to communicate science in general, especially when you're not communicating science in your own language. I guess I'm just really lucky enough to be in the position I'm in and to be a native English speaker. Um, and so what that has meant for me is that uh, all of these amazing communities I'm involved in, and uh, I mean, we can talk about uh, the work I did with the Ramon Foundation afterwards, but basically through my work with them, I got involved in the uh, Horizon community, which is a community of uh, Israeli space educators, people from you know the, the public sector, uh, in, in space nonprofits, people who are teachers in academia, in you know the private space industry. And so uh, getting involved in this community kind of gave me all of these amazing connections to parts of the space industry that I didn't know existed. You know, um, I knew that um, you know Israel has an air force, and and with air force and you know satellites, there has to be some kind of space you know industry that existed. But I didn't really know anything more than that until I actually started meeting meeting all of these amazing people through the Ramon Foundation. Um, and so yeah, well, <laughs> I, I basically met a, a few people from Space IL uh, through the Ramon Foundation. I went and I did a lecture training with them. They had a plan that in the years leading up to the launch of Buried Shit of the uh, planned moon lander, um, which I still claim it landed on the moon, it just didn't soft land. Um, I mean, you're right. <laughs> Here's the thing is that it landed. I mean, it, it crashed. Landed. It crashed, but it landed. But that's still landing. I mean, you know, if you, I mean, what, what are they saying? I crash landed the plane. Right. Crash is in there, landing. but it's landing's landing. also in there too. So, I mean, it got there. Now the next step is just making sure that it can do something afterwards. <laughs> I'm fine to throw about precise language and technicality. <laughs> Semantics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Um, but, but yeah, I, I was lucky enough to get to know a lot of good people from, uh, uh, from the Space IL uh, organization, uh, which is a non-profit. And the majority of their work, and this was the training I initially did from them, was uh, lectures. They basically looked at um, looked at Barry Shit, looked at the moon lander as an opportunity to kind of mimic this, this fabled Apollo effect. Now, I know that there are some people who disagree with what the extent of the Apollo effect was, you know, an uptick in people who were suddenly interested in space and science after the Apollo missions. But they said, we want to make sure that every child in Israel gets exposed to a lecturer, you know, coming in and actually telling them the story and making space accessible and understanding that even a relatively small country like Israel with, with a, you know, when you compare the, the uh, Israeli space agency to uh, NASA, to the ESA, to JAXA, um, it, it doesn't even compare. And so to be able to show them that a couple of guys with engineering backgrounds could get together and say, hey, we're gonna do this. We're gonna make this happen. Um, I think it, it taught it an amazing lesson to a lot of kids and some of the students who I teach in other contexts, um, I don't think a single one of them, when I started speaking about Space IL, especially around the launch, um, every one of them had heard of it, you know, before I even started talking to them. I remember I missed a few lessons in one of the programs I was teaching in. Um, I taught uh, or continued to teach in the a Hebrew Youth University program. They have a young astronauts program that I teach in. And I remember missing a few lessons uh, during that trip when uh, when we all met up and went to the launch of Burrow Shit. And I came back and I thought it'd be cool for you know, me to share my experience and tell them some stories about it. And most of them had heard everything. Most of them had stayed up in the middle of the night to actually watch the launch to, to, to be involved in it. And so you can really see that Space Isle actually achieved its goals, even if it's not, you know, it's scientific goals, but it's it's more general goals of space education and inspiring a generation. And I really think it'll be interesting to watch the next generation of scientists and space scientists in Israel. And I, so we actually got to see that launch together, which was great. Um, so we just had this really, uh, we had this, this stroke of luck that um, you were going to be in the country at the same time as the launch. A fellow friend of ours uh, who um, who actually was in the student astronaut contest that I was in a couple years ago, Emily Calendrelli's student astronaut contest, uh, Lee Giat, who had won the contest, um, is from Israeli descent as well. So it was this really cool thing where it kind of all came together and we were able to go and see this launch. And I know that had to mean, you know, a lot for you all. Like, hey, listen, this is, you know, we're going to put something on the moon, 
even if it crashed, it still went to the moon. And uh, that that's I think that's amazing things that we're seeing more and more of the world um, have their own space agency accomplishing more things. And uh, you did mention the Ramon thing, the Foundation, and it was something I didn't know about until I met you. So um, let's talk a little bit of, uh, more in depth about that and kind of give people a breakdown of it. And uh, if I remember correctly, too, that's the name of the conference that you went to this year, right? As well? Don't they also have a conference or is it just based around that. So, so yeah, it's uh, there are a couple of different Ramon conferences, but but the um, for people who don't know the background of the Ramon Foundation, um, it kind of ties everything together. Basically, the the first uh, Israeli astronaut, Ilan Ramon, um, who was uh, uh, unfortunately died in the uh, uh, shuttle disaster of Shuttle uh, One Hundred and Seven, Columbia, uh, along with his fellow astronauts. So after after he perished. His wife, Rona, uh, who actually also died uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, unfortunately, um, she decided that she wanted to, to commemorate him and to carry on his legacy by creating just a, pretty much the entire community of, of space education. I mean, there were some things that existed beforehand, but basically the Ramon Foundation triggered the creation of multiple nonprofits and different organizations. And as you said, the, the Ramon conference, um, and there's both a technical conference um, where industry leaders come together to meet, discuss technology. These industry leaders from you know around the world, not just, um, just not just within Israel. And the same thing goes for the Ramon education conference, where also you have um, astronauts, you have educational experts, all coming in to discuss these, um, you know, how to to build the next generation of uh, scientists and, and 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 to bring people towards STEM. Um, using space as this kind of inspirational thread that's connecting everything together. Um, so the actual uh, program that I taught in for the Ramon Foundation is a program called Space Lab. And Space Lab has a very simple premise. It's project-based learning. And it's something that I think was totally lacking for me in my education. Um, but, it, but it seems so simple when you think about it. The idea is that over the course of two years, um, you take high school students and you build them up with a series of projects. Now, each project is named after one of the members of the Columbia Shell team, and each one focuses on a different task. Uh, the first task, if I recall, the first task was to create a, a video that explains a scientific concept. The second task was to create a Wikipedia uh, entry, also you know, explaining a particular scientific topic. And keep in mind that these kids are doing this in Hebrew, and so there are a lot of Wikipedia entries that exist for you know, multiple different scientific topics in English, but not necessarily in Hebrew. Um, and so there were a series of, of, of missions of different projects like this. And the final mission that the students are building up to is actually to plan and prepare a, an experiment that if they win the Space Lab competition, it actually goes up to the International uh, Space Station. And it was just a, a thrilling two years to be part of um, I worked with uh, a, a school, a religious boys' school here in Jerusalem, and it was just a phenomenal experience uh, all around. Unfortunately, um, the experiment that my students designed, which is an experiment, uh, it was involving testing the uh, growth of stem cells in zero gravity. Um, also, something I didn't really particularly know a lot about beforehand, and not that I know that much more about it now, uh, certainly no expert. But yeah, um, their experiment unfortunately didn't win. But all of the experiments that these students are talking about, you know, uh, eighth graders, ninth graders, preparing these experiments that astronauts and industry experts are coming around, you know, in the final uh, competition and looking at them and just being stunned at the, at the sheer level of professionalism. Um, so it was really a wonderful program to work in um, and to be a part of. And uh, I think this is actually a, a perfect way for us to dive into some of the, the first questions that we have. Um, so this comes from Abigail Bolenbach, and she asks, what advice would you give beginning college students to prepare for an upper grad degree or career in obs observational physics? And uh, one of the things that I do want to mention, too, and that I always appreciate is that you have the honesty about, you know, this has not been easy. Really. Because yeah, I'll I'll talk to you about stuff, and you know you you were helping me with pre-calculus and trying to figure things out, and it seems like it's the easiest thing in the world for you, but you also have the things that you struggle with as well. So definitely, I mean, from somebody who's who's really putting in the time for it, you know, what's what is your advice for for people that may want to follow? Well, I mean, the first thing I'll say, Abigail, uh, thank you for the question, is that the fact that you're actually looking to figure out the right way to go about this is the first great step. Um, there are no perfect ways to do it. 
Um, and the advice I'll give you is things that have worked for me and things that in hindsight would have worked for me if I'd done them. Um, an important thing for me to start with is, as I said at the beginning, I wasn't planning on studying science. I was sure I was going to be a lawyer in high school. And I went to a high school that for some reason allowed 10th graders to decide the rest of their future by saying, hey, if you don't want to take math or science after 10th grade, you don't have to, um, which I think is, is silly. I mean, 10th graders, 11th graders, 12th graders don't really know what they want to do with the rest of their life. So the first thing that I would say, the first piece of advice is don't close yourself off to any options. Um, for people in general, for all college students, make sure that you're keeping your options open in terms of taking math and science courses. Specifically for you, uh, to prepare for a, a degree in uh, physics or in uh, observational uh, astrophysics, I'd highly recommend making sure that you have a strong mathematical background when you go into it. Personally, I started my degree, I did a preparatory program the year before my degree, and when I went into that program, I hadn't touched anything to do with math in over six years. I barely knew uh, you know, how to take a function like 2x equals y and to find out what x equals. I didn't know any of it. I discovered Khan Academy, which is a fantastic resource. I hopped on it. Preach. There was a tip. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's phenomenal. I basically started at third grade math and just built my way up. And, and to be honest, Khan Academy's math level actually um, continued to grow with me. And a lot of the math um, and, and videos and material that they have there continue to be relevant throughout the first couple of years of my degree. So get your math set. I think it'll only make it easier for you to understand the physics that comes afterwards. Because at the end of the day, the math is, it's a language, it's a series of, of kind of, uh, uh, agreed, con agreed upon conventions that people use to describe the natural world. So if you have the math down pat, um, and there's no shame in starting from zero like I did, if you have the math down pat, it'll really make it easier to get into the physics. And uh, I want to just, you know, definitely second that. Uh, you know, when I started, I had to start all over again with remedial. Well, first I had to get my GD. Then I had to take remedial math in college. And, you know, it, a, a couple within, you know, a couple of semesters, I was a pre-calculus. And, uh, you know, while I will still have to go over those things again before I go into calculus and physics, it is still something that is, um, it's paramount. You And it's not just understanding some of it really work towards the mastery as much as you can. And that's one of the reasons that Khan Academy is such a great resource. Um, I can't, I can't mention that enough. That tutor guy is also another one that I really love that really helped me a lot uh, with what I was doing whenever I was trying to, to get through some of those classes and some of those, some of those harder things. So uh, the next question we've got is going to dive a little bit into astronomy. If I can. And, sure. Please. Sorry. Just, just one last note on the, on the math thing. Mm -hmm. The way that math is taught, um, both in high school and in college, isn't it's a one size fits all system. It's not ideal. And, and the most important thing I can say is to look to get the intuition, right? Because, because you know, just trying to solve problems and to, you know, have a formula that you plug in some numbers into doesn't help as much. Use these resources like Khan Academy, um, like the wealth of YouTube videos that exist, and there are so many channels, you know, but thankfully we're living in a time when, when social media and the internet is just saturated with so much information look for the intuition and build up on that uh, because these things are meant to make sense. They shouldn't be things that you memorize. Sorry, Ron, I just, I felt it was important to, to nail that in. No, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, and thank you for sharing it. Um, I mean, really in anything, well, and that's kind of the thing, this is a daytime show for us. Um, so, you know, there's gonna be <laughs> Is that yeah that, that really do we get questions from a lot of great people sometimes questions come from parents asking for their kids and that's something important to remember uh you know go out uh, i heard bill and i say it one time it's like you know what's your what's your piece of advice and it's like algebra learn algebra it's just it's something about it that really helps you to, to understand and get that you can grasp really difficult things because algebra wasn't easy at first and then you get to a point you're like algebra is not easy but it's not the complex thing i thought it was <laughs> once i got pre calculus. I mean, like you said, I was I was helping you with with pre calc right at one stage, and and like my I have a lot of friends who have like asked me for help along the way, and I'll get WhatsApp messages at eleven o'clock at night saying, you know, why does this work? I mean, my cousins, you know, friends of mine, and the thing is, when I was learning that stuff only like you know five six years ago, I had no idea. It it seemed like absolute gibberish and a foreign language to me, and I did not understand it. And now at the point where I, I, I relish the opportunity to give up on the stuff that I'm doing now, which is more complicated, to jump back to that stuff because I've built up the intuition. I have it and I enjoy it. Yep. 
That's perfect. So we're going to do a little bit of stuff on astronomy here. Um, and uh, so Gary is asking, uh, any cool events or cool uh, any events or cool information about the upcoming Saturn opposition and the increased brightness on the ring? So I think the first thing we should do is answer what opposition is for people that don't know. We you all have a tendency to get a lot of people that are new to astronomy and these kind of concepts. So let's talk a little bit about that. What is opposition for people that don't know? So uh, opposition uh, and the movement of the planets is something that I don't really deal with a lot. So if I say something that isn't precise, feel free to correct me. Yep. Um, but basically the movement of the planets and the way that we see them is dependent on their relative position to us and the sun, right? So basically we have certain periods throughout the year when the planets like Saturn, like Jupiter will line up and they'll be exactly on the opposite side of us to uh, the opposite side of earth uh, with respect to the sun. And so in those times, they're actually much more lit up uh, by the sun and the alignment is what allows for us to actually be able to see them in, in, a, in a more full way. Great. And so that that's also when they're the closest to us, too. So, I mean, Saturn's going to be big and it's going to be beautiful. So if there's anybody around now, I do not know that Gary mentioned. And the thing is, too, with Gary is Gary is a very professional amateur astronomer who takes some of the best astrophotography I've ever seen. So I'm so glad that he asked the question. Um, but I did not know about the increased brightness on the ring. So go out there, look into it. There's some really awesome things going on. We've got a really busy month and that opposition will happen about a month, a month from now. It's going to be on July 20th or so. So um, definitely uh, check it out. Um, and we may be even doing some virtual star parties here on Space Foundation in between now and then. So hopefully, we'll be, yeah, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to show you some stuff. Um, so this yeah, is some of the links. Honestly, I spend so much time looking at, looking at radio data that I've forgotten what optical data looks like. Well, I, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, we might be able to do one with Deep Sky Dude, who was our guest a couple of weeks ago. We do, uh, I do some lives with him from time to time, and we've been talking about it for a while. So maybe no time like the present, if he can get some clear skies, maybe we can, uh, we can do that and show you all opposition on that night. So uh, next question we got is from Sunny, and Sunny is from uh, Star. If you don't know what Star is, please check it out. Sunny's going to be a future guest on the show as well. Sunny wants to know how important space education is to build space ecosystem in any country. Ooh, deep question. Yeah, um, I think it's of a, a paramount importance. I mean, space, as I was saying before, is both the uh, the incentivizer and the inspiration for people to get into science. And without a, a strong scientific uh, foundation, both in terms of understanding and inspiration, it's very hard to develop the sort of things that would you know lead to a space ecosystem. You need people who are heavily motivated to to push these industries that are starting out, and you also need the scientists. You need engineers, you need mathematicians, you need designers, you need physicists. Um, so I would say that it's of imperative importance to use space education as a source of uh, inf information and inspiration. And, uh, you know, so that's something that you actually do a really great job of with Fun Fact Science. And actually how we met was through the Science Leap, where you brought a group of us together, um, science communicators across, you know, different platforms to discuss space and science and highlight some really, really great people. So one, let's talk about the idea. How did you come up with the idea for the Science League and, uh, you know, how that kind of came together? Whew. I mean, the Science League for me was just kind of a crystallization of the same idea that brought me to Fun Fact Science. It was, there are all of these amazing science communicators that I can see out there. Wouldn't it be amazing if for, for a couple of days or for a week, we all got together and we all focused on the same topic? Um, whatever it is, whether it's a, an interesting topic um, or whether it's a really important topic, um, I just thought that that would be the best way to go about, you know, getting that message out there it would be to kind of get people together to amplify the, uh, the signal. And so uh, I think the first one was just all the people who I had gotten in touch with. I think it was, it was Graham Lau, uh, the, the uh, cosmobiologist, who put me in touch with you and introduced us the first time. And then so basically it was um, you, uh, myself, Graham, and all the people who you would introduce me to and we all worked together on, I think it was a Women in STEM. Um, and it was just a wonderful collaboration where we all focused on, you know, uh, uh, Annie Jump Cannon, Cecilia Payne, the, 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 uh, and other women who were basically the founding mothers of astronomy. You know, when you look at what was happening with astronomy uh, 100 years ago, it wouldn't have gotten to where it is today without them. The classification of stars, you know, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which basically is a, is a chart of the evolution of stars in terms of their brightness and their temperature, that all came from their work. 
you know, um, understanding the, uh, the composition of the sun that also came from the work of female scientists. And at the time, a lot of these women were not even recognized as scientists. They worked in, in a small kind of organization that was technically part of Harvard, but not really, right? Uh, Pickering's Girls or Pickering's Women, I think they were called. And I just felt that it was hugely important for us to shine a spotlight on these amazing women and to actually recognize the great work that they did. And I had to give you, uh, you know, some credit on that one too, because uh, it was very heavily focused in the second season of Cosmos. There's a whole episode mm -hmm. on it. So if you haven't seen it, it's the episode called Sisters of the Sun. And Cecilia Payne ended up writing what ended up being a textbook for astrophysics that is still something that is constantly referenced and is named as one of the best um, astrophysics texts to this day. And uh, that was some time ago. I don't remember exactly, so I won't give the exact one, but it's it's been a minute. <laughs> so um, we got uh, we got a couple more um, questions for you here. And uh, let me see. I'll just log it. Da, 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 as I accidentally noticed that I missed my question. So, um, but yeah, putting that together, I love the fact that you did, um, that you decided to focus on that. So for the very first one, what made you say, you know, let's talk about women in STEM and bring these people to light because they are names that aren't always talked about. These are very definitely some hidden figures, something that Cosmos in particular is big on, I, you know, introducing you to people like him and uh, Fritz Wicke and, uh, you know, these names that you may not know. Like some people know Faraday, but not a lot of people know who Fritz Wicke is. And a lot of people thought he was nuts at the time. It turns out he was a genius. So let's talk a little bit about why you decided to go with those women. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just blanking. I'm just blanking because there was a quote by Fritz Wicke that I read the other day that was just my favorite quote of all time. And now I'm blanking on it. Um, I, I'll, I'll have to look it up later and I'll send it to you. Um, as I, yeah, as I was saying before, the reason I chose to focus on that is just that I think at that time there were a lot of different uh, things that I was involved in that were pointing me in the direction of, of the research of these women. Uh, so whether it was like fundamentals of astrophysics, that it was a course that I was taking at that time, or it's, you know, astrophysics and cosmology, um, the fact that that course, when I was taking it, it was taught in two parts. The cosmology part was taught by uh, a male professor, an amazing professor called uh, Yuval Birenboim, and a female professor, uh, Orly Knott. And it was just, the entire course was fantastic. But I think the fact that uh, uh, women are so underrepresented in science in general, and, then I, and I, for the first time I had a teacher who, uh, um, an astrophysics teacher who was a woman, I think that might have also had something to do with it. Um, and in general, I have to say, I've seen an improvement over the time that I've been studying. I've seen an improvement. I think that in my cohort, it was roughly 30% uh, of the cohort um, uh, were female. Um, I'm not sure how, what percentage uh, actually ended up finishing the degree because it's, it's a pretty high dropout rate. But yeah, like you said, there, there are so many great people who are actually looking to communicate this information these days, um, You know, whether it's Cosmos, whether it's other science communicators, it's just... It's out there. It's it's being expressed. People are actually pointing at this. You know, you have movies like Hidden Figures that are actually looking at you know not only women, but African American women who were just totally glossed over in in the history books. Um, and I think that we're in a, an amazing time where people are actually looking back and trying to recognize the great work uh, that, that women like that did and continue to do. Uh, you know, I couldn't say it better myself. I know it's one of the reasons I was glad to, to jump on there and uh, and be a part of it. And um, just for a quick reference, too, because um, so many people don't know who Fritz Zwicky is. Um, he is generally thought of as the father of dark matter. Matter? Matter. Yeah, dark matter. I had to think about it because I always get dark energy and dark matter kind of messed up there a little bit. But, um, yeah, definitely look look into some of these names. There, It's always incredible to find out a little bit more. There's a lot of these heroes of science that have been hidden figures, and it's something that I, I promise is worth checking out. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about your work as a research assistant here as we start to wrap up. Um, you uh, you got to work on a project a couple years ago, and it was AT2018 Cal. And I know that it was something that was kind of special. I know it was something you were really excited to, to share uh, on your platform. So let's talk a little bit about that and what it means to be a research assistant and be a part of, you know, something that is a, a discovery, you know, what, what we all dream of doing, you've kind of been there. So let's talk about that. Um, 
Firstly, uh, it wasn't it wasn't my discovery. Uh, it wasn't something that it was even just a discovery of my team. It was uh, definitely a global collaboration between a bunch of different teams. So it's important for me to not take any credit uh, where credit isn't due. Um, at that time, um, and it continues to be that the majority of the research work I do is on a very basic level. It's it's mostly uh, finding transients and then uh, collaborating to actually get them followed up. Uh, meaning our team will have uh, different telescope arrays, radio telescope arrays that we work with um, in the UK, in Australia, in South Africa, uh, in, in South America, where uh, and in North America as well, in New Mexico, where basically once we have discovered a potentially interesting astronomical transient, we will then use the time that we have on these telescopes to actually uh, follow up these events. Um, now, what was special uh, at that time is that pretty much the entire world just immediately turned all their telescopes to this event. It was uh, an astronomical transient that was extremely bright. I don't remember the exact numbers because it was two years ago. Uh, that, by the way, is something you can tell by the name. Uh, AT just means astronomical transient. Uh, 2018 was the year it was discovered. And then COW, COW was just the uh, serial number. Basically, all these transients, as they discover, they get a serial number that starts from AAA and you know, moves on and so forth. Um, some of them end up having names that are more memorable, I guess. But basically, everybody became interested in this transient. And what was special to me was the fact that I felt like I was actually um, part of it in a, in a way that actually meant something. I was um, compiling a list of basically all the updates that were coming from different telescope teams, uh, different astrophysical teams around the world, um, and using telescopes of different wavelengths whether they are uh, you know, infrared telescopes, radio telescopes, optical, x-ray. I didn't even understand before this event how x-ray telescopes work fully. Uh, not that I'm an expert now, but basically I was compiling um, a list and, and, and basically a, a centralized location of information from all of these different sources, and that document was being used by other people to make their decisions and to make their kind of, uh, uh, to gain insight into the development of this event uh, as it continued to develop over time. It's, I mean, it's always fascinating to talk about these really cool things. And I, I love this because this kind of ties into, uh, you were talking about using remote, uh, a remote observatory, correct? Uh, Gary wanted to know, what are your thoughts on getting a remotely operated <laughs> telescope on the lunar South Pole? I think it's a wonderful idea. I think if it can be achieved, it's a great idea. Um, in general, most wavelengths of light are either, you know, attenuated or locked entirely by Earth's atmosphere. Um, so having space-based telescopes is, in my opinion, you know, if it's achievable, if the money's there, it's always a great idea because it allows us to get a better look at the universe. On the moon itself, um, I haven't really heard much in terms of planning on an optical telescope or anything like that on the moon. What I do know is that recently uh, there was a NASA project that was funded um, to put a radio telescope on the moon where basically it would be a a uh, telescope array that's built into one of the craters of the moon. Uh, for anybody who's not really familiar with radio telescopes, they work in large, for the most part, uh, parabolic dishes. And so you can use a crater on the moon as if it's a parabolic dish, uh, you know, like the um, you know, radio or satellite antennas that, uh, that you're probably used to seeing. So to use something like that as a telescope, I think would be phenomenal, um, if not for the science and data that would be able to get um, just for the sheer sense of achievement that humans are building telescopes on the moon, I think it would be an amazing step and it could uh, lead to some exciting discoveries. So uh, as we wrap up, let's let's ask the big question, man. What's the next big event, like launch, anything that you're excited for? I know we got an annular eclipse coming up this week. There's things all over from astronomy to missions. So is there anything in particular? Is there anything from the Israeli Space Agency that's coming up? Anything from Space IL that's got you excited? Whew. Um, that's a tough question. I mean, talking about space-based telescopes, I'm obviously excited for the uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which unfortunately keeps getting delayed, especially because of uh, COVID-19. But I would absolutely love to see the optical and infrared images that come from um, from that. It would be amazing. Uh, space IL is indeed planning to launch another mission. Um, and I hope that as many people as possible get involved to share that message and to share a goal of international collaboration, um, because that really, for me at least, is what space is about in a lot of ways. Um, 
if I can you know, go back to the Ramon Foundation topic, one of the amazing things that, uh, amazing quotes that I heard from Ilan Ramon, that I heard from his late wife, uh, Ron Ramon, and something that I think pretty much every astronaut has said um, is the overview effect. It's when you're in space looking down on Earth, you don't see those squiggly lines that define a border between a country. Um, you, don't, you don't see countries and, and you know, uh, ideology and politics. You see a planet, you see a little blue dot, a pale blue dot. And I really think that the, the, the most important things for me and the things that I'm most looking forward to is future collaboration, both in terms of uh, space uh, development and building technology and, and expanding human exploration in space, but also looking out into space, you know, building these amazing collaborations like the Event Horizon Telescope, which, you know, connects radio telescopes from around the world um, and any other telescope like that, any other collaboration, which I see a lot of in astrophysics and observational astrophysics especially, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Um, that's what most excites me and that's what I'm most looking forward to. Uh, man, it's been a pleasure to have you on today. Tell us everybody, uh, tell everybody where they can find you on social media, your personal pages, fun fact science, all that fun stuff. Um, you can find me at uh, fun fact science on Twitter, at fun fact science on Instagram, and at FF science on Facebook. Also, we have a website that we're working on at the moment. It's still a work in progress, but you can check it out if you'd like and send us an email if you have any suggestions. Uh, and it's uh, funfactscience.com. Um, Ron, thank you so much for having me. This was uh, an amazing opportunity. I'm glad I got to, to share my thoughts and my opinions with people. And it's, it was great to chat. Great to catch up. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you for joining us and, and talking about all the amazing work that you're up to and kind of shining a little bit of light about uh, the science and space industry in Israel. And uh, may, hopefully I'll be able to get out there sooner rather than later. Maybe we can get uh, one of the first uh, episodes of the new Universal uh YouTube series that I'm working on. Uh, maybe we can do it out there and uh, that would be pretty amazing. Man. So we appreciate you coming on. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. And that's going to conclude this episode of the live edition of Space Foundation Space for You podcast. Do not forget you can subscribe to the podcast and leave a review on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, and on Google Play. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And of course, our website, www.spacefoundation.org, where you can also learn about the various ways you can support the Space Foundation. Don't forget also to visit www.discoverspace.org for more digital content for teachers, parents, and students. You can support the Space Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit, by visiting www.spacefoundation.org backslash donate. And on all these outlets and more, it is our goal to inspire, educate, connect, and advocate for the space community because at the Space Foundation, we will always have space for you. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode on Thursday.